Well, uh, today we're going to be uh, starting our, our series in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be going through 1 Thessalonians uh, throughout the, the summer. And 1 Thessalonians, if you haven't read it, is just a, it's, it's a powerful book. Uh, it's a practical uh, book. And hopefully, uh, by going through 1 Thessalonians, it will uh, encourage us to live out our faith in Jesus every day uh, while we're waiting for His return. Uh, we're only going to look at three verses this morning, uh, but they're three uh, pretty big verses. Uh, but today we're going to focus on three uh, Christian qualities or three aspects um, of our Christian life that, that should be in our Christian life. And that is faith, love, and hope. Um, we'll see today that Paul had those three things. Uh, the believers in Thessalonica, they had those three qualities in their lives. And we too should display faith, love, and hope in our lives. So before we uh, dive into 1 uh, Thessalonians, I think we need to look at a little uh, background information first to kind of help us to understand uh, what's going on here. So I'd like to go back to Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 6, because this is kind of where the, where the story starts. So Acts 16, 6 through 10 says, They, uh, which is Paul and his com companions as they're on their second missionary journey, uh, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia and were prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in Asia. When they came to Messiah, they tried to go into Bethania, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to. So bypassing Messiah, they came down to Troas. During the night, a vision appeared to Paul. A Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to evangelize them. So Paul responds to the call. He's obedient to the Lord's leading. And because of his, his faith in God, his love for God and his hope in God, he goes and he ends up in Philippi. And while he's there in Philippi, uh, he meets a, a woman by the name of Lydia. And uh, uh, Paul leads Lydia to the Lord. She gets saved. Um, after that, Paul meets this, uh, this slave girl who was uh, possessed by a demon. Uh, he cast out the demon from the slave girl. Uh, but the owners of the slave girl were, were not happy because this demon was somehow able to predict the future. So uh, Acts 16, 19 through 24 says, When her owners saw that their hope of profit was gone, again, because uh, the demon, demon was uh, able to predict the future through her, uh, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, bringing them before the chief magistrates. They said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. Then the mob joined in the attack and against them, the, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had inflicted many blows on them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to keep them securely guarded. Receiving such an order, he put them in the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. So wait a minute here. I mean, didn't we just uh, figure out that, that God was leading them to go? Didn't God, you know, speak to them and say, hey, I need you to go over here? Uh, was God leading them to go this direction? Uh, didn't God know that there was going to be bad things that was going to happen? Didn't God know that there was going to be suffering that was going to take place? Did God really lead Paul and his companions into suffering? Could, could God lead us into suffering? And the answer to all those questions is, is yes. God often uses sufferings and trials to accomplish his life, his, his will. And later on, it was, it was Paul who wrote back to the church in Philippi where he says, For it has been given to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So I'm not saying that we should uh, desire suffering um, <clears throat> or, or bad things to happen to us. Um, but what I am saying is that when bad things happen, when trials come and sufferings come in our lives, which, which they will, we need to have our eyes open. We need to have our eyes open to whatever his will is in that situation. So often we want to close our eyes. We just want it to, to be over with. But we need to keep our eyes open in, in these situations and say, Lord, it hurts. Lord, I don't understand. But Lord, what is your will for me in this situation? 
So while Paul and Silas were in the inner prison chained up like criminals, what did they do? They prayed to God and they sang hymns to God. Why? Because they had Jesus. They, they had faith in Jesus. They had love for Jesus. They had hope in Jesus. So the difficult circumstances in their life was not going to prevent them from living for or worshiping Jesus. So the same is true for us. When we have difficulties in life, trials and sufferings, those things should not prevent us from living for Jesus and worshiping our Jesus. And we know the rest of the story. What does God do? God uses Paul and Silas to, to save the jailer. They had their spiritual eyes open. They, they, they wanted to know what the Lord was doing in this situation. And they were able to lead the jailer and then his whole family to the Lord. They had their spiritual eyes open. And then in the inner prison with their feet secured to the stocks, what did God do? Acts 16, 26. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. Our God can do anything. He is a miracle working God. He is just looking for, for, for those of us that would have willing hearts to say, I'm yours, Lord. I'll, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything for you. So through sufferings, in difficulties, people are saved and the church in, in, in Philippi was started. God then leads uh, Paul and his companions to Thessalonica. Paul enters the synagogue there and he starts to share the good news of Jesus there. And we're told that many get saved. But in, uh, but in Acts 17, 5 through 10, there were several people that, uh, that were not happy. It says, but the Jews became jealous and they brought together some scoundrels from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. Attacking Jason's house, they searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. When they had not found them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here too, and Jason has received them as guests. They are all acting contrary to Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The Jews stirred up the crowd and the city officials who heard these things. So taking a security bond from Jason and the others, they released them. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea. On arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews to share the good news of Jesus again. So Paul, as he is in Berea, he is then run out of Berea because the, the, uh, the, the Jews from Thessalonica had hunted him down in Berea. And so he had to flee from Berea also. So, but we see town after town, people are getting saved and churches are being planted. And each time it's, it's because of persecution, suffering, difficulties. God is working in those situations and people are getting saved and churches are being planted. So Paul leaves Philippi, goes to Thessalonica, goes to Berea. He has to get out of town in Berea. He goes to Athens uh, for just a little while. After Athens, he goes to Corinth. And then while he's in Corinth is where he writes back to the church in Thessalonica. He writes back to them to encourage them to live out their faith. He's writing back to say, hey, I know it's hard. I know you're being persecuted. I know it's difficult, but continue to live out your faith in Jesus. So let's look at that now. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 3. Paul writes, uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We always thank God for all of you, remembering you constantly in our prayers. We recall in the presence of our God and Father, your work of faith, labor of love, and endurance of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this would have been a, a normal uh, first century introduction. We see three things that are kind of always listed, listed, and that is the name of the writer or the writers, uh, the name of the addressee or the addressees, and a formal uh, greeting. So we see all three things included in, in verse one. Uh, Paul was obviously the, the writer. Uh, Silas and Timothy uh, were with him as he wrote to the church in Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica was a, a big city back then. It was probably around 200,000 people or so. Uh, it was the capital city uh, in Macedonia and was one of the main ports uh, in that area. Um, and if we go back 
further than that, it was founded in 315 BC by the, uh, a Greek general by the name of Cassander, who served under Alexander the Great. And uh, so he uh, founded the, the city and named the city Thessalonica after his wife, Thessalonica. So if you're looking for a good baby name that hasn't been used a lot lately, Thessalonica might be it for you. Um, so the church in Thessalonica uh, was started, started through suffering, just like the majority of the churches are. And so again, Paul is writing back to them to encourage them to live out their faith during difficult times. In verse 2, Paul writes, We always thank God for all of you, remembering you constantly in our prayers. Paul was a man of prayer. At the end of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5, he's going to tell them to, or instruct them to rejoice always and to pray constantly. And so I have no doubt that he, he, was, he was living this out in his own life. And I think in this verse we get a little bit of the, a secret behind Paul's power and strength that he had in his life to endure all the sufferings and all the trials and persecution that, that he went through in his life. And that was through prayer. Paul was a prayer warrior. He was constantly in prayer. He's teaching about prayer. And as we read his books, he's constantly thanking God through prayer uh, for other people. And so he is constantly in prayer. And so he's, he's connected to Jesus. He's walking with Jesus moment by moment. I believe he had peace because he was connected to peace. He had love for people because he was connected to love. He had an eternal outlook on life because he was connected to the eternal God of the universe. He had the King of Kings as his Savior. He had a relationship with Jesus. He had a relationship with God. So the first question to ask is, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Are you saved? Are you part of his family? Have you put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Every single one in this room is in big, big trouble with God because we're all sinners. And the only way we can be saved is by the blood of Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross. So has there been a time where you've put your trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior? I encourage you to do so today before you leave. And so if you have put your trust in Jesus, then are you tapping in to that power? Are you tapping into Jesus every day through prayer? So we too can have incredible peace and power and love and hope and faith in our lives if we stay connected to Jesus through prayer. So as we're talking about prayer, I'm going to throw out uh, four qu uh, quick, simple questions for you to be kind of thinking about um, and try to apply these to your lives. So the first, first question is, do you believe God exists? Pretty important question if we're talking about prayer. If we don't believe that He exists, then obviously we're probably not going to pray. But if we believe He exists, then we should be, should be praying. Number two, do you believe God hears your prayers? Number three, do you believe God answers prayers? And then number four, how much time do you spend in prayer daily. So if we would say yes to the first three questions, oh, I believe he exists, I believe he's king and God, and he, can, he hears everything, he knows everything, and he can do anything, then how much time are we spending with him in prayer? So this should be probably pretty convicting to all of us. All of us probably need to spend more time talking to the king of the universe. So in this verse, what, what is Paul talking to God about? He's talking to God about people. He's not talking to God about stuff or things or this or that, but he's, he's talking to God about people. And again, we see that through a lot of his letters. He's, he's always thanking God for people. But so often, what do we do? When we go to God, we, we pray about stuff and things and money and happiness and jobs and tests and finals coming up and all that. And all those things are important. And we should be praying for those things. But I think the most important thing we should be praying about and for is people. And so because of Jesus, because of what he's done for us on the cross, we have, we have complete access to his throne. We can go directly to the King of Kings and lay our request at his feet. So the question is, are we going to him? Are we going to him in prayer? Are we spending time with him every day, moment by moment, talking to him throughout the day? 
And then do you have a time in, in, in your day where it's just you and God, just you and the king, and you're just, you're just in his presence, just talking to him? If we really believe he exists, if we really believe he can answer our prayers and he loves us and he's there for us, man, we should be spending as much time as we can with him every single day. So are we people of prayer? Verse 3, we're going to spend the rest of our time on, on verse 3. There's a lot here just in this uh, one verse. Uh, so verse 3 says, We recall in the presence of our God and Father your work of faith, labor of love, and endurance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, this was a, a thriving church. Um, even in the midst of persecution, trials, difficulties, their faith was growing and their numbers were growing also. So this was a thriving church. So the first thing here that Paul mentions um, that he remembers about them while he's in the presence of God uh, through prayer is their work of faith. So they completely trusted in God. They completely trusted in what he was doing in their lives. And because of that trust, God was able to do great things in them and through them. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we want to please him, we need to be walking by faith, not by sight. We need to be trusting in God daily. That means trusting in him with, with everything, the little things and the big things. He wants us to lay everything at his feet and, and completely trust in him. Um, I had a video and it didn't work, so I'll, I'll try to share the story, but I'm not going to do a great job of it. But there's a, uh, a famous uh, tightrope walker by the name of Charles Blondin um, in the 1800s. And uh, there's a story about him crossing Niagara Falls. And I think he was the first one to cross Niagara Falls uh, on a tightrope. Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as Blondin, was a famous tightrope walker and acrobat. He's perhaps best known for his many crossings of a tightrope, 1,100 feet in length, suspended 160 feet above Niagara Falls in the USA. His act would be watched by large crowds and begin with a relatively simple crossing using a balancing pole. Then he would throw away the pole and amaze the onlookers. On one occasion, he crossed the tightrope on stilts. On another occasion, blindfolded. Another time, he stopped halfway to cook and eat an omelette. In 1860, a royal party from England came to watch Blondin perform. After his normal spectacular crossings, he then wheeled a wheelbarrow from one side to the other as the crowd cheered. Next, he put a sack of potatoes into the wheelbarrow and wheeled that across. The crowd cheered louder. Then he approached the royal party and asked the Duke of Newcastle, Do you believe that I could take a man across the tightrope in this wheelbarrow? Uh, yes, I do, said the Duke. Ah, hop in, replied Blondin. The crowd fell silent. But the Duke of Newcastle would not accept Blondin's challenge. Is there anyone else here who believes I could do it? Asked Blondin. No one was willing to volunteer. Eventually, an old woman stepped out of the crowd and climbed into the wheelbarrow. Blondin wheeled her all the way across and all the way back. The old woman was Blondin's mother, the only person willing to put her life in his hands. So are we sitting in God's wheelbarrow? Do we trust him enough to let go of everything? Are we willing to say, Lord, just here's my life. I, I'll give it to you. Carry me through life. Are we trusting in him with everything? with our marriage, with raising our children, with, with maybe sickness or financial problems, marital problems, whatever it is, are we trusting in him with everything, all aspects of our lives? Or are we trusting in self? Are we trusting in, I can do it. I think I have the strength to do it. I have the wisdom to do it. God wants us to completely trust in him. So he wants us in his wheelbarrow, no ropes, no seat belts, no parachute, just complete trust in him. And when we get into his wheelbarrow, that's when he can do great things in us, through us, 
and around us. And it may be difficult. It may be difficult, but that will be the best place that we should be in God's will. Him carrying us through life. Uh, many of you know the story of Saeed Abedini, so I won't share the, the whole story, but uh, he was converted to uh, Christianity in, in the year uh, 2000, roughly from Islam. Uh, he became an evangelist. Uh, he started several house churches in, in Iran. Um, and roughly in 2009, the Iranian government told him to, to stop evangelizing, stop preaching Jesus. Um, they beat him, all this kind of stuff for a little while. They, they let him go, though. And so he, his wife, his children moved to the U.S. They became U.S. citizens. But from 2009 to 2012, he would go back and forth and continue to meet with the house churches. And uh, he had started an, an orphanage. Um, so he was working a lot, um, getting this orphanage going. Well, in 2012, he was arrested for threatening national security, which means he was arrested for being a Christian. He, he didn't break any laws. He didn't do anything wrong. He wasn't a bad person. But because he was a Christian, um, he was um, arrested, put in jail, put in one of the worst prisons in the world where he was beaten. He was tortured and almost killed, again, for just being a Christian. He had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to get out of prison. They would tell him, all you have to do to get out of prison is to renounce Jesus. Turn from Jesus, turn back to Islam, and we'll let you go. Everything will just be, be fine. We'll let you go. All you have to do is renounce Jesus. Well, almost two years later, he's still there taking the beatings, being tortured, almost killed. Why? Because every time his answer is never, will I renounce my Jesus? He has Jesus, his Savior, his King who, who, who loves him more than anything, the one who died for him, how could he ever turn away from God? So he is, he is never going to turn away from his Jesus. He will endure the sufferings. He will endure the, the persecution, the trials. And um, that's somebody who has faith. That's somebody who's working out their faith. That's somebody who has put their trust in Jesus and says, I will do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll say anything. I will do whatever you have called me to do. Living out his faith, even when it's difficult. I was reading an article about this whole situation and, and I, I read uh, uh, a story here uh, from Nogme, um, his, his wife. And anyway, in, in the story, um, Nogme uh, makes this comment. She says, the Lord has counted our family worthy enough to send Saeed to a dark place that he would be able to share with people who are in complete despair. She went on to say that because God has placed her, placed her husband in this situation, so many have given their hearts to Christ. So there's no telling if Saeed will ever be released. There's no telling if Saeed will uh, even survive being in prison. Um, but they're trusting that God is working in this situation. It's hard, it's difficult, I don't understand God, but they are trusting that God is going to be glorified, people are gonna get saved, and God is in it. She went on to say, at this point, there are no more options with the legal system in Iran. At this time, it has to be a miracle. And so, just by her statement, by saying, the Lord has counted our family worthy, you kind of get the feeling there that she, she, they, they consider it a blessing that God would use them in this, in this way. And again, we're talking about severe suffering and persecution that the Lord has counted our family worthy enough to go through this time. And so it's going to be a miracle. It's going to have to be a miracle to get him out. Well, God is in the business of doing miracles. So Nogme and his wife are trusting in God. They have complete trust in him. Situation's too big. There's no way to, that they can fix it. But they believe, they trust that God can fix it. So do we have that kind of faith? Are we trusting in him in the little things? And are we trusting in him the big things? So again, whatever the situation is in your life today, he wants you to give it to him. He wants you to give everything to him. And when we do, he can do great things in us, through us, and around us. The second thing Paul remembers about the Thessalonians is their labor of love. So because of their, their love for God, they were working hard 
um, at living for Jesus and serving Jesus and sharing the gospel. And this love came from putting their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so since God is love, they are now con connected to love. And so they, they wanted to be like Jesus. God demonstrated his love for them by going to the cross and suffering and dying. And they were willing to do the same. They're willing to do whatever. Next week, we're going to look at a powerful verse where it says that the gospel is ringing out from them. And so love, they, they were loving people. The gospel was ringing out from people. And so this, this word uh, labor in Greek means to toil. And so they were working hard at serving people. They were working hard at sharing the gospel. And this was all pr prompted by their love for Jesus. So, so our question is, do we have this kind of love for God where it's prompting us to, to serve and to help people? So is your love for God leading you to, to follow him wherever, wherever he leads and to do whatever he's calling you to do? Is your love for God motivating you to give more of your time, your talents, your treasures to him here at Trinity? Again, this year we're, we're talking about being devoted, completely devoted to one another to God and to the ministries here at Trinity. So is our love leading us into service? Is our love for Jesus leading us into serving him and doing anything he calls us to do? And so what does love do? When we're uh, acting uh, through this love, love helps us to do all things. Love helps us to love the unlovable. Love helps us to, to serve when we really don't feel like serving. Love helps us to, to forgive. Love helps us not to be selfish. Love encourages us to, to share the gospel. Love bears all things, hopes in all things, and endures in all things. So are you living in that love today? Is love leading you in, in everything that you do? Are you toiling to serve Jesus? Are you laboring? Are you working hard to serve Jesus because of your love for him? I, uh, I looked up the, the, the 10 hardest jobs um, that are out there, and you may say, well, that's mine. My, my job's the hardest. But according to this list, um, there's 10 jobs that were the hardest jobs out there, and, and one of them was a helicopter lineman. And so I didn't know what a helicopter lineman was, so I looked it up. And so a helicopter lineman is a person who goes really high up in the sky, and he, he fixes these high voltage electrical lines that are really high up in the sky. And the only way to get up there is by helicopter. So the helicopter takes you up, and uh, the pilot kind of steadies the, the, uh, the, uh, the helicopter. Um, the helicopter lineman kind of hangs out of the helicopter. And when I was reading the article, it said, and often with his bare hands, he fixes the high voltage uh, electrical wires. I'm thinking, well, don't work for that company. I mean, they don't even give you <laughs> gloves, you know, to use. But it says, often with your bare hands, uh, he, he fixes these high voltage uh, voltage electrical wires while hanging out of a helicopter. And so I'm thinking he's toiling at his job. He's laboring. He is working hard at his job. So many of us, we toil, don't we? We toil, we work hard at our jobs. We, 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 we work hard uh, to provide for our families. But I guess the question that we need to answer, I guess, is if we're toiling and working hard for money, and just to provide and things like that. And we should do those things. But how much more should we toil to accomplish God's will? How much more should we labor and serve and toil to accomplish all that God wants to accomplish in our lives? For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So he gave his all because of his love for us. So we ought to give our love, our all, because of our love for him. He gave his all, we ought to be giving our all. So is your love for Jesus prompting you to serving him with all of your heart, mind, and soul? Finally, Paul is thankful for the Thessalonians because of their endurance of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, in the midst of persecution um, and difficulties, they had a, a work of faith, a labor of love, and endurance of hope. And this word uh, endurance means bearing up patiently under a heavy load. So any trial, any difficulty, any persecution or problem is, is hard stuff. Um, 
But the Thessalonians, they were not giving up. It, it would have been easy just to give up and say, hey, I'm not going to live for this, this Jesus. I'm just going to live for, for myself because it's easier that way. But they didn't. They endured patiently. And what makes it possible to endure patiently? The hope of Christ's return. The hope of knowing that he's coming back can give us that, that hope that we need to endure anything that goes on in our lives. And then also just knowing that if we die, if we die today, we're going to be with him forever. So if he comes back, amen. But if I die today, amen. I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus. So knowing that we will be with Jesus forever should give us the hope to endure anything this, that, that this world throws at us. And so our life, as we all know, it is just a speck on the eternal radar. We're just here for just a short period of time. And so our momentary afflictions are just that, momentary. So our difficulties, our trials, our persecution and all that is real. But we need to remember that this is not our home. We are not going to be here forever. And so our time here is short. So the question is, are we making the most of the time that God has given us? Are we making the most of the time of the good times and the bad times? So we should be making the most of whatever situation that we're in. Again, having hope because we know that we will be with him forever. And we know that he's working in every situation. He can help us in, in any situation. So there may be people here today that feel overwhelmed with life, who are carrying these heavy loads. Again, maybe it's a, a physical problem, a financial problem, family problems, marital problems, job problems. Uh, maybe it's persecution. Maybe you're being persecuted at, at your job. Uh, wh whatever it is, God wants us to endure patiently. Again, trusting that he will work all things out for his glory. Loving while we go, serving him while we go, and knowing whatever the situation is, he's, he's in complete control. We may not understand it, and it may, hard, it may be hard. It may even hurt. We may be chained up in a prison in Iran. But Lord, man, I don't know why I'm here, and it hurts, and I don't want to be here. But Lord, may your will be done, because I trust in you. I trust that you're going to work it all out for your glory, and you have the plan. And I know your plan is a lot better than my plan. So I can't uh, imagine Saeed Abedini uh, and what he's going through this very second. I can't imagine what his wife is going through this very second, knowing where her husband is and being separated and not knowing if he'll ever come home. In the article that I read, uh, Nogme said this, You know, my ultimate hope is in God. I can't think of the eight-year prison sentence that he has. It just paralyzes me. God has given me continued hope to take it a day at a time. I am grateful for all the people signing the petitions. Ultimately, ultimately the time Saeed is in that prison is not decided by the Iranian government, but it's appointed by God. That's someone who has hope in God in the midst of a very, very difficult situation. So what are we to do? Hebrews 12 kind of tells us, Verses 1 and 2 says, Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. So we endure because Christ endured. We run the, run the race with our eyes on Jesus. We fight the good fight. And we even suffer if God calls us to do that because, again, we know He's in it. We know he's in control. We know that he can free us and save us. And we know that he can do anything. So we need to have our eyes open, our spiritual eyes open in these situations and say, Lord, what is your will for me? We can trust him in every situation. So these three qualities, Christian qualities, faith, love, and hope should be lived out in all of our lives. The Thessalonians were living this out in their life they were shining brightly for the world to see. They were bold with their faith. The Abedini family is a living testimony of that. They're being bold with their, with their faith, living for Jesus. So in closing, I'm just going to share uh, one last uh, statement from Nogme. She said, when we cling to him, when we cling to Jesus, we receive 
this amazing living God and his joy and peace and favor. And the world wants it because they are going through trials without Jesus. So they say, how are you thriving in these trials? And I say, because I have a relationship with Jesus. I don't have religion. I have a relationship. So Jesus is our everything. He's King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He is everything. We can trust him. He will never, ever let us down. So don't hide your faith, but live out your salvation with faith, love, and hope. Amen? Amen. Amen.